Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon and welcome, everyone. My name is Kim Ricketts, and I'm here to introduce and welcome Steve Hamm, who is visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. From the earliest days of portable computing, entrepreneurs and designers have pushed forward relentlessly in a quest to create the perfect device. Their efforts have produced a few successes and many failures, but they never give up driven by the basic rule, innovate or die. By tracing the history of this quest, we can learn many valuable lessons for people in any industry, including innovate constantly, create design principles that are timeless, and many more. Steve Hamm is a senior writer in Business Week's Information Technology section. Hamm first joined Business Week in the Silicon Valley Bureau and was then named an associate editor in New York. Hamm is a graduate of Carnegie Mellon University and the author of Bangalore Tiger, about the rise of the tech industry in India. Please join me in welcoming Steve Hamm to Microsoft Research to discuss his new book, The Race for Perfect, Inside the Quest to Design the Ultimate Portable Computer. Thank you. I have all these devices here. I've got to remember what, what order to use them in. So it's great to be here. And I was just reflecting as I was driving up that I have not been here for 10 years. It's just an incredible thing because I... I used to work in Silicon Valley, and I would come up here, cover Microsoft, I'd come up here every few months, and, and then before that I worked for, um, that was at the Mercury News, I mean, sorry, that was at Business Week, before that I worked at, uh, at um, PC Week and did the same thing, but it's been 10 years, and I re was remembering, the first time I ever visited this campus was to, to visit with this guy here, Steve Saunders, I don't know, 88 or something, it was one building and one pond, as I <laughs> Six buildings in one pond. You were in building four. Well, it seemed like one building. <laughs> they, they were small buildings. No, they weren't shacks or anything. But uh, yeah, I remember that distinctly. What a, what a, what a day that was. And it is, it's changed pretty dramatically. So I've been a technology journalist almost 20 years. And technology has been very, very good to me, as it has been to, to all of you, I know. And uh, so I've been very happy with it. And uh, one of the, I'll reflect on how things change and kind of the, the way time kind of expands and contracts. But I arrived at the Mercury News from the New Haven Register in the spring of 1989. And I went in, and the first thing the editor of the business section told me was, we sat down, we talked, he said, it's too bad you came too late. He said, all the go, go, go days of the technology industry are over. You know, it's all happened. Now all we have is traffic jams, and it's boring, and nothing changes anymore, and all this kind of stuff. It's a tough break, but you know, you'll, we'll, you'll, I'm sure you'll find something interesting to write about. So since then, of course, I mean, God, it's just innumerable things. I mean, uh, you know, there was the CD-ROM era, the multimedia era. There was the early wireless stuff that was happening in the early 90s. And then uh, I remember in, uh, in the summer of 94, I, I have the way of kind of like learning about things a little late and wondering and, and then finding out that it really wasn't that late after all because I went, I said, what's this internet thing? And I, what are these browsers? So I, I, I called up a woman named Roseanne Sino uh, who was at Mosaic Communications in Mountain View. They had eight employees. And I went down there with my friend uh, Larry Aragon. We said, can we come down and show us what this thing is? So we had the original eight engineers who were playing like Nerf ball games and all this kind of crazy stuff, show us how a browser worked. And uh, so that was kind of one of the, one of the fun things. But we've, so I've been all through all these things, the, the, you know, the, the dot-com boom, the dot-com bust, the, the, all the busts. It seems like it's been one bust after another. Uh, <laughs> for, uh, though I'm, I'm, there have been high points as well. But uh, I had the great opportunity to write a book about India uh, and one thing that I've always liked in my life is I, I grew up in a small coal mining town, and so a lot of my experiences in my life were about the ends of things. It, it was a dying coal mining town. So in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh was actually pretty successful when we went to, to school there, but later uh, it went into decline. But I had the great opportunity to write about India as the Indian tech industry emerged and, uh, and got to see that happen, and, and that, was, uh, that was great. And so that took me into writing about globalization quite a bit. 
And uh, at, fortunately, at, Biz, at Business Week, you really are, if you're a senior writer, you're allowed to kind of follow your nose. You know, if there, if there are things that interest you, you go out there, and as long as you keep producing good stories, lots of them, and also high-profile ones, they pretty much let you do what you want to do. And um, so when, when uh, IBM sold its PC division to Lenovo, I thought this is fascinating. Here's, here's a, the first Chinese company that's really trying to become a global brand. They buy this iconic chunk of IBM, and they bought it for the ThinkPad uh, brand, really. And um, so I started writing a story about uh, Yang Yangqing, who's the chairman of Lenovo and who'd been the CEO of Lenovo when it was a Chinese company, all about this, this combination of, of uh, two cultures and two companies. And um, I was down in Raleigh, North Carolina, where there, at the time their headquarters was, briefly, uh, interviewing him. And they, they filled out my schedule by taking me into the design um, shop uh, there. And uh, the, um, the head of design, a guy named David Hill, said, I've got to show you some things. So he showed me this whole uh, kind of chronology of the designs, starting in the early 90s, all the way through all the ThinkPads, and then he, then he said, uh, but I have this vision. I have this vision that we can, we've been, you know, the, the people from Lenovo have told us, don't worry about cutting penny, a penny here, a penny there. Innovate again. So for the first time since the late 90s, the people at ThinkPad, or probably since 2002, the people at ThinkPad were given the license to innovate. And he says, oh, let's do crazy stuff with this. So he showed me these, these models he had made, these prototypes of uh, the, the thinnest computer you'd ever seen, probably a half inch thick, uh, nothing visible on it. It would look like a piece of slate. And in fact, part of his idea was that you, you would see no, none of these plugs, nothing on the bottom, no stickers, no vents, no nothing. Uh, it would all be hidden. So this, it would be this, the, the epitome, uh, the perfection of this vision of the ThinkPad that had been invented in the early 90s by Richard Sapper, one of the great industrial designers um, in history. And uh, so he basically said, he, you know, he said, I'm showing this to the, to the chairman and the CEO today. We're going to see if we can get something going. So that was how my book started. And um, um, it was, you know, to, to be on the ground floor of something like that, a project like that, was a great opportunity because, you know, one of our, Part of our, drag, uh, our, our bag of tricks as journalists is we tell these narratives of you know, the whole story from the beginning to the end. Those things are pieced together after the fact when people can't really remember exactly what happened and in what order, and they conveniently forget a lot of the mistakes and, and fights and all that kind of stuff that, and, and, and wrong turns. So I said, if I can follow this from the beginning all the way along, they won't even know what to cover up because they won't know what's going in the wrong direction. And these people were totally open to, to doing this. So I, I interviewed, oh, four or five of them every month, sometimes twice a month, and others every couple of months. So I was able to follow a, a course that lasted uh, about a year and a half and, uh, and forms a piece of the book. The book ultimately became two things. It became a history of portable computing, a popular history of portable com computing. I, I discovered that it had never been written before, which stunned me. Uh, little bits and pieces have been written, but never the whole thing. And then I wove through this narrative of this product, which I conceived of like Tracy Kidder's The Soul of the New Machine, which is a book written in the late 80s about a data general supercomputer project. So anyway, that, that was the, how this came up. Um, along the way, the last few years I've... I've written, since I've been writing a lot about outsourcing, and I've come in contact with a lot of, uh, well, with the fact that there aren't a lot of young Americans who want to become software engineers, not as many as, as I think we would like. Um, and so one of my goals uh, recently has been to try to um, get kids interested in being inventors and entrepreneurs rather than in just consumers. So... Uh, one of the things I did after I published my book, one of the great things about Business Week is when you publish a book, they let you have a story, uh, an excerpt or something like that in Business Week, and it goes to a million people, so that's pretty good distribution. And I, but rather than doing something normal, I said, well, geez, 
I want to reach young people. Business Week needs to reach a new generation of readers if they're going to survive another decade. So I decided to do what I thought was a manga, but I've been informed by my younger colleagues that's not a manga, it's a cartoon. So, and I don't know what, I don't really know what the definition is, but it's definitely not Japanese, so that's probably part of it. So, just for pure entertainment, I just thought I'd show you this slideshow. I think Nikola Tesla is one of the most amazing people, and I'm, I'm looking for today's Tesla. Could be in electricity or could be in something else, but something related to networks. So if any of you know who the mad genius of our era is in, uh, in, in networks of that kind, uh, I'd love to know about it. So here, here we go. So Alan Kay, everybody knows who Alan Kay is, right? Grew up in, um, his father was a professor, an itinerant professor, never got tenure anywhere, so Alan had the great opportunity to live in a lot of places, including Queens. Uh, went to the Air Force, learned to program there, and then went to the Uni University of Colorado to get his undergraduate degree and University of Utah, the time that Ivan Sutherland was there. And he and a pal tried to make a personal computer did not succeed and he was interested in education he, I mean he basically educated himself he, he claimed and he thought that children could educate, educate themselves better than, than, than adults could because adults were kind of lost and focused on trivial things and stuff like that so anyway he, so he, Seymour Papert was at the MIT Media Lab, and he was running the first tests of computing in classrooms. These were mainframes. It was in Lexington, Mass. And Papert was uh, kind of a crazy guy. So after he, he got inspired by Papert, he saw the opportunity. He thought this could be the biggest thing since Gutenberg. And he drew this little picture of a boy and a girl with these devices that had never been pictured before, or conceived before, communicating with each other, creating things. And then he went out to Xerox Park, and he was there in the 70s. And uh, crazy time, you know, why, why Xerox was funding this, no one knows, but it was a great thing. They were hooked in to, with DARPA. Most of their funding was with DARPA. And, I mean, I, why was DARPA funding this? But anyway, they were funding it. And uh, these guys went out and created all sorts of small personal devices. And... Uh, that guy saying we have to make a machine that can do everything and be cheap enough so we can make 100 of them was Chuck Thacker, your colleague in the Silicon Valley Microsoft Research. And they made the note taker, which was made by a guy named uh, Fairbane. And you notice the note taker, how much it looks like the, compact, the first compact machine and the Osborne machine. So they kind of ripped them off. And of course, there's another great ripoff. Steve Jobs went down, had a nice tour, soaked up some ideas, and uh, see how that happened. I love this. We found a young cartoonist out of one of the graphic design schools, and I just loved how he made the, the, the tack clack tick 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 thing. Kind of, it worked. And uh, this is John Scully. Did you guys tune into the Knowledge Navigator and Dynabook in the 80s? Yeah. It's very interesting stuff. And then that led to the Newton. And um, Alan Kay was on the edge of the Newton. He was not invited into the inner sanctum, which is probably good for him, because we all know what happened with it, even though it was, in, a, in many ways, a remarkable device, but not remarkable enough to escape total scathing criticism. Uh, and then this is, he's kind of aged gracefully. And his, his, when I asked him what was the, mo the thing that was most like his original vision, he said the Exo computer. And of course, that was he and Nicholas and Papert were pals on this, worked together on it. And he really liked the Kindle. And he said to, he, he liked some of that e-ink, e did some really nice crisp uh, text graphics on that. 
And he said, oh, maybe we could actually make a Dyna book. So he started looking into it. And when I first talked to him about it, he thought it was possible, but, and he was aiming for this 40th anniversary event in Silicon Valley, which happened a few weeks ago, the day after Obama was elected. And uh, he was all excited. But as these things often do, he could not get the, he wanted to make a prototype of the original Dyna book. Did not happen, still hasn't happened. But I asked him at the, at the end of all of my research and all my conversation with him, I was having lunch with him out in L.A., and I said, well, are you satisfied? And this was actually not something he, sp he said at this event. It was something he told me, which was uh, that you are, you're never satisfied. And I think that's a pretty good answer. So, um, I contacted my son, his friends, my nephews and nieces, and said, please, put this up on your Facebook pages. <laughs> Give me some distribution. And I guess they did some of that, so that helps some. Um, so, I thought one of the big lessons of this, this episode, which was in the book, was the gap between when you can imagine something and when you can do it. So, he imagined this thing in 1968, the first commercial computers that looked anything like what he imagined came out in the mid-80s from um, Toshiba and Compaq. The device that he had in mind and all of his capabilities still hasn't been made. So, you know, that's kind of an incredible, mind-blowing thing. Um, one of the things that was in the Knowledge Navigator concept was the idea of intelligent agents, which, you know, there was a flurry of activity around that with General Magic and those, some of those guys in the, uh, the early 90s, but um, never really had, you know, until recently has really come back again. So I, what I really liked about this was this idea of a quest, uh, you know, reaching, stretching, going for something big, something that's going to change the world, uh, falling short, trying again, you know, dealing with all the parameters of, rea of reality, those things that hem, that hem us in. So I thought that was a good story. I think that's, you know, it turns out when I, look, when I think back on the, the long stories I write, they're usually about quests, so it's probably, so it shows you something about me as much as, as about what I'm writing about. But, uh, so, we've got these computers. They are portable. They can go with you anywhere. They're, they are truly the most personal of the personal computers. They're the ones that take on all these personal characteristics, like fashion. You want to have it, I mean, people now have these fashion items. In fact, I bought one on Friday. It has kind of a nice pattern on it. So, I actually asked them for something matte black, but they didn't have it, so I ended up with, with, with fashion instead. Um, so, um, the reason that I thought this, one of the reasons that this quest is so difficult is because, you know, the normal parameters of computing or the normal uh, tr vectors of computing are price and performance. That's been the way it has been, you know, for 50 years primarily. But the beauty of this is that it's price and performance and you have these additional vectors. You have compactness. And also, uh, uh, fighting against compactness is the, f the fact that you want a good user interface, you want a good user experience. And also, uh, you've really gotten into design and, and fashion as other aspects of it. So that the designers and engineers uh, and product developers have to think about all of these things, and no wonder it has been so difficult. Um, one of the things I thought I, I discovered or I was reminded of when I was working on this book was that the first smartphone phone I ever encountered was in 1992. It was something called the Simon from Bell South and IBM. And it actually, one of the characteristics was that when you t twisted it, the, 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 you could get, it, it would shift, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the word, but anyway, it's like the iPhone, which was, people said, oh, this is the first time we've ever seen this happen. Well, the first smartphone in 1992 had that feature. But certainly, the, um, we've seen smartphones come a long way. Um, so, perfection's a funny word, but 
And you might think of it as kind of artificial, but the, the fact is that as I interviewed people, and I interviewed more than 100 people who were pioneers of portable computing, everyone said the word perfection, that that was the thing that motivated them. I, I'm looking, I want to make the perfect thing. I want to make it perfect. I, I've been questing for 30 years to make the perfect thing. People, uh, my whole career has been consumed by this. So these, are, these people were unnaturally passionate. They were obsessed. And uh, that's why I thought it made a good story. Um, as I said before, the story of portable computing had never been told in its entirety. And so that was a great opportunity. And a lot of the bits and pieces had been known, but, but I, I found that there were, some have already been forgotten. And some have never been told. And there were some great little nuggets that I want to tell you about that I, that I discovered along the way. So Rod Canyon, you know, co-founder of Compaq, guy from TI, right at the earliest days of uh, the PC, uh, quit, quit TI after the PC was introduced, wanted to, originally wanted to make a disk drive, but everybody, there were like already 100 companies making disk drives. But he, uh, instead, he, he made a compact computer. But he, uh, he told me this story. He said, uh, after they launched Compaq, uh, he actually, he went to a computer conference that was in San Francisco. And he had never met uh, Bill Gates before. He talked to some of the engineers and people like that at, at Microsoft, but he never met Bill. But he got an audience with Bill and Microsoft had uh, rented out a Victorian mansion in one of the neighborhoods of San Francisco, and he said that kind of you went in and it, and it felt like a, a party. It, so it, it was like a party. It was a party in the first part of it, and then Bill was in the back room, and people would wait outside and they would be ushered into the back room and they would meet with Bill. And so he's a Texas cowboy. He has this funny Texas accent. And said I'd heard he was some kind of a genius, you know, and he said I went in and he was this funny, long-haired guy, and, and uh, so Canyon had figured it all out. He saw that the, there was, uh, the PC industry was fractured. Of course, there were every PC maker had a different version of DOS. There was no, you'd have to, every uh, application maker would have to make a different version of their application to run on it. So he came up with the idea of the clone industry and of BIOS compatibility and, and all, the, all the other features of compatibility. And so he laid this on Gates at this meeting. And he said, Bill was nodding, and he was, you know, stroking his chin and stuff like that, and he really seemed to get it. And, and from that, we went on and we created the PC industry, the clone industry. And I, so I checked back with Bill later. I said, Rod claims that he came up with the idea of compatibility. And he said, well, I pretended... Like I, like I didn't know, like I hadn't thought of this before, but actually, I just wanted him to do all the work. So, <laughs> so I let him go off and do, they, they, they set up the Chinese wall in, in, um, in Houston, and they, they did all the BIOS work and handed it back to Microsoft. So I thought that was pretty funny. The other story that I thought was remarkable was uh, about John Scully. This guy... Um, had been fired from Apple in the summer of 1992. And I never, I was the business tech, I guess I was the acting business editor at the Mercury News at the time. And the, the explanation for his firing, I was never satisfied that we really understood it. They had one bad quarter when the entire industry had a bad quarter. It wasn't a terrible quarter, and he was fired like that. He was out as CEO, into chairman, then out as chairman. They let him hang around to introduce the Newton, which might have been their idea of torture, I guess. I don't know. But um, so I said, when I got him on the phone, I said, what, what was that all about? And he said, in the fall of 1991, my wife and I had been living in California for eight years, and my wife was from Connecticut. She wanted to move back east. So I hatched a strategy, a giant strategy about the future of Apple Computer because my wife wanted to move east. He said, I came up with the idea of breaking the company in half and having Newton and QuickTime and all the new stuff and all the digital stuff and all the multimedia stuff in a company that would be based in New York City and the Macintosh company would be 
based in Cupertino, and maybe we'd sell that. And he approached the board with this idea, and at first they were like, wait a second, I'm not sure. And then, but they, you know, he was the CEO, and they, they asked him to get Goldman Sachs to come out and talk to them, and they actually had AT&T and IBM come and kick the tires on the Macintosh company. This was in the uh, winter of um, uh, uh, 1992. And, um, at a, but at a certain point, and I guess it was at that point, he had to tell all his executives. He hadn't told the executives in the company, just the board. And when the executives at Apple heard this idea, they loathed this idea. I mean, they just could not stand it. I mean, they couldn't, they could not wait to go to the board with knives out and just carve this guy up. And he was gone. He was gone. That was the end of it. I mean, they just, every little bad secret that had ever been in the company or whatever, you know, uh, was out, and, and he was out of there in, in no time at all. But, you know, uh, one of the things I found in writing this book, too, was there was a lot of unburdening. I mean, people, I asked people about things that, that, I, that had never been public before. Part of it is, you know, 10 or 20 years has passed. Part of it is people getting older. They, they, they want the truth to come out, right? And uh, Scully was amazing because he, he said, you know, being fired didn't bother me. CEOs get fired. He said, what bothered me was the Newton. He said, the way, he said, that, that comic strip by Gary Trudeau that made a mockery of what we had dreamed. And you know what, it wasn't that bad, you know. Uh, he said that was, uh, hurt him. It hurt him deeply. It hurt him for years. And he, ha he, he told me that he had finally gotten over it, but he, he had not gotten over it. This guy was still damaged by this experience all those, you know, more than 15 years later. So, uh, there, were some, there were some nice, interesting surprises. Some of those were unknown stories. There were also some interesting surprises about people's motivation. Jeff Hawkins, one of the, uh, one of the greatest inventors, I believe, in personal computing history. Um, so, he's from Long Island. His father was inventor. His father, when, when, when Hawkins was in grade school, the Weekly Reader came out, a little magazine that was, was distrib distributed in, in, in uh, elementary schools in those days. And there was a picture of his father on the cover with gathering the speech patterns of a, um, of a porpoise. And he was basically trying to learn the language, language of the dolphins, you know. And so this was his father's thing. He was, an, he was this crazy inventor guy, built a, 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 a boat that floated on, that on air above water, all sorts of crazy stuff very early. And so this guy was, a, was a, an inventor. I mean, the, one of the first things he learned to do was weld. You know? So these guys were a family of inventors. So he invented the grid pad. The grid pad, part of grid systems, the first tablet computer that really used uh, stylus extensively. He invented uh, the Palm Pilot, the first successful handheld, and then he invented the Trio, the first successful smartphone. So here's the guy who did all these great things. And you think, oh man, he's driven. He's driven to invent portable computers. He said, ultimately he told me, you know, what I was driven to do, and he, he didn't even tell me this when I was writing the book. He told me a month ago when I visited him. He said, it was all about making money so I could invent a computer that imitates the biology that, that imitates the biology of the brain because he'd always been fascinated with neuroscience and he'd studied neuroscience he went he went and got it he went towards a phd at berkeley but ultimately never got it but it was all about getting money and credibility so that he could he could invent the the true brain computer which is what he's working on right now with a company called numenta so um the another thing i mean there are many lessons out of Jeff Hawkins, but one interesting thing was his last portable invention was something called Folio, which he talked about in the summer of 2007, and he conceived it, uh, it was a device actually about the size of this one, and he conceived it as a companion to your smartphone. So it's not a companion to your PC or your desktop or your laptop, companion to your smartphone. And... Um, He'd been working on it for several years, and it actually was never released because some other, well, I think um, uh, a private equity company took over Palm between when he 
was about to release it and when, and when it was supposed to be released and they just said, cut that cost right here because we don't see that as a big, as a big thing. But um, the, um, and it, you know, and, and it hasn't been released and he actually holds out hope that it will someday but, uh, but with the Palms problems it probably never will. But I thought this showed, uh, this demonstrated a couple of important lessons and one is that even great inventors can be wrong and two is that we still don't know whether he's wrong or not. I mean, he might be right, but, you know, five years from now, which I think there have been plenty of people who have been right, but five years off and been, have been, you know, horrendous failures. But uh, another thing I think it demonstrates is, you know, we're still, after all these years of portable computing, first conception, 68, first prototype research machines, mid-70s, first commercial machines, early 80s, we're still, I think, in the Wild West days of portable computing. There's still a tremendous amount that can be done and there's a tremendous amount of invention. I mean, since then, I believe, he, he first talked about this in May of 2007 at the D conference. July 2007, iPhone, first iPhone comes out. You know, here's Steve, uh, understands when all of the miniaturization, all the chipsets, all the screen technology, uh, all that is available to be integrated and does it in a way that people forgot that he didn't create all those things. All he did is put them in a beautiful package that really worked. And, and he launched a, an innovation race, which we're seeing, you know, it's just the, 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 the pace of innovation in, in smartphones and those kinds of handhelds is, is ferocious. So I think that's one of the exciting things about this. You can kind of get into a little bit of a lull and then you just, you know, things just kind of take off again. Um, and now we have the netbook. And so, <laughs> I'm so excited about this little thing. You know, I've, I've never been an early adopter, and I'm, I'm not an early adopter of netbooks, because they've been out for a few months. I mean, in, but um, I bought this on a whim last Friday night. I just couldn't help myself, because I've been reading about them, and I've been doing some market research, and I went into Best Buy. And I knew that I was, you know, I, I've been going on author speaking things, and I really can't take my... I can't take my, uh, my company computer on this because it's, you know, it's my company computer. So I needed a laptop and I decided rather than buying the $3,000 uh, uh, Lenovo ThinkPad X300 that I had written about, I said, M you know, I'm going to buy a $400 HP Mini, which actually does everything that I needed to do, including it's a solid state uh, drive and I can take it to Africa and things like that, which is one thing I'm planning on doing. Uh, I thought there were some pretty interesting things about this. So it has all the applications I need. Most of them are downloadable for free. It has a version of Windows that I believe cost the OEM $15 or maybe $10. It has Works on it, so I don't have to buy Office. So there, I've, one former Microsoft person told me that this is a bigger threat to Microsoft's revenue stream than Linux has, was. So I don't know if that'll prove out to be true, but it's this shows you the dynamism of, of our times and how things can come along that, that, that shake things up. Did I say it costs $400? I mean, I'm a very cheap person. That's, that's a wonderful thing. So, uh, so we have devices like this that are made to be maybe not always connected, but very persistently connected. And uh, so we're at this inflection point. Uh, they're inexpensive, very portable, they're connected, and we're clearly at the beginning of a new era of possibility. And I, I would call it portable plus cloud. So you, you can do a bunch of things in the cloud that, that extend the power of the portable, and don't, so you don't have to pack so much into it. All that, all that compression uh, and all of that expensive circuitry that you had to pack in these things before. You don't have to pack so much in. So you can, you can have incredible databases in the cloud and you can have incredible uh, processing in the cloud. So I think this is going to be a really exciting period and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, you know, one of the funny things about my industry is that as more and more is written just for the web, 
and more and more is written in these in very discrete pieces. There is very there is very little context. You you find that there are stories. Oh, there's this device, that device. There's this conflict. There's that conflict. But but you you kind of lose the um, you lose the context. And I was I've been asking around recently. Has have you, has anyone seen a major journalistic piece about Portable Plus Cloud? And I haven't actually seen one. So I, if you guys haven't seen one either, I'll probably write one. So has anyone seen one? Who knows? Maybe it's a bad idea. Maybe that, <laughs> that might be what, what I'm really hearing. But uh, so anyway, I think we're on the on the on the front end of this, um, and I think it's really exciting. And what the database acts, uh, app I'll talk about is um, there's this really interesting guy, John Ellenby. John Ellenby was a manager at Xerox Park in the '70s. He was the founder of uh, Grid Systems, which produced the first laptop computer. The, Grid Compass, and somewhere along the line, and a compass may be a key. He's a sailor. He just he loved navigation, and along the lines, he decided. Well, what he wanted to create was the possibility to use a device, and ultimately that became the smartphone with GPS and a compass in it. And the conception is the device is the mouse or the pointer, and the world. Is the inner is the graphical user interface, right? So you're walking down a street. Yeah, I can see some quizzical looks. Yeah. Anyway, so you're walking down the street, and you're a tourist maybe, and there's a nightclub over there. You're in New York City. Click on it, and of course this uh, this anticipates that there's a lot of data back behind the scenes. You click on it, and you know who's playing tonight, who's playing tomorrow night, what the dress code is, blah blah, all this kind of crazy stuff. The whole world backed up with these kind of databases, starting with tourist information and, and entertainment information, maybe historical information. Maybe you go to Gettysburg, and you could point to the whatever the crooked knoll or whatever the crazy one of the one of the one of the bad scenes at Gettysburg, and you can get uh, all the information you could want, uh, both canned and also you can browse beyond it into other things you want to find out. So GeoVector is his company. And they have a service that is operating right now in Japan, and he, he hopes soon will be in the United States. So I think that's a great example of the power of the database, uh, along with the portable device, the big database in the back end. Processing power, the ones I think about are voice and language processing. So IBM has this service right now going in Iraq. It's been going for about a year and a half, where they have laptop computers. No, no. I think they're mainly handhelds, but some laptops. And basically, it's a real-time translation device. They can get a bad guy, and they can interview him or her, and they can, as quickly as they speak in English, you know, they, they make sure that the translation is, is, a, is a fair translation into Arabic, or, uh, and, um, and then they, they can have a conversation back and forth. Um, and so there's a lot of processing back in the cloud on that one. And I think one of the one of the coolest, you know, you can see some other uses other than war, thank God. But I'm a tourist who manages to learn when I go to another country with a foreign language to find out how to order a beer and how to ask where the bathroom is. And that's basically it. So how about having a little device that would be, you know, full of tourist information, but also where you could go up to a person on the street and say, you know, anything, and you'd have a real-time translator there. I think that would be just a tremendous, tremendous application. So you can begin to see the power that can come from uh, Portable Plus Cloud. Even some things that aren't, I mean, there's some things that are just kind of funny, but very practical, like I was reading in the New York Times that there's a, a new uh, iPhone app called Sit or Squat. Sit or Squat is something that when you go to major cities in the world, it, and you, it will show you where the nearest public bathroom is to where you are. So, so I don't know. The squatting part I don't quite get, but maybe it's in developing countries or something. Yeah. yeah right. um, all right. So you see the potential. I'm really excited about the potential of Portable Plus Cloud, but 
There's tremendous complexity. A question, please. Do customer reviews on that sitter squat? <laughs> uh, they do have reviews. That's part of the content. Cleanliness, whatever. Yeah. It's not just where it is, but it, whether you really want to go there. Okay. So, so we got these great devices. We got the cloud. There's a connection between that device and the cloud. But you're stuck. You still have these islands of activity, of application, these islands of information. What do you really want? You want all your information in the cloud in one place. I mean, virtually one place. And you want it to be aware of each other. And you want it to, you don't want to have, you want to be able to find it. So there's this huge opportunity to integrate, to store, including backup, but to store, to link, to integrate uh, data and applications in the cloud. And uh, it, I, I think of it as the digital you in the cloud. So I'm going to, I'll work on that and see if I can come up with a book title. Or maybe Nicholas Negroponte will do it. Share. Pardon me? You want to share your data. Oh, oh yes, yeah. that's right. That's another aspect of it. Yeah, you could have permissions or automatic sharing or those kinds of things. Yeah, I think there's a, there, there are tremendous opportunities there. But, you know, you think about, so think about Windows, the Windows file system. The Windows file system has been very useful, but a cause of tremendous frustrations. Now, what you need to do is come up with a version of the Windows file system for the cloud that is, that also, while, while you're doing that, also gets rid of all the frustrations of, of the Windows file system. So I guess there's, there are things like, you know, virtual files and things like that. Searching. You know, I'm always amazed that I can search the web on live search or on Google search, and I can get exactly what I want in about two seconds. But when I search my own hard drive, sometimes uh, even on Outlook, just searching emails, it can take me, you know, five, six minutes to find the email that I want. So I, I, I haven't been able to figure that out. But we, yes? I think one of the reasons, part of the phenomenon is called edge caching. Yeah. Uh, but if you, yeah, you can index your drive and how often you do that. The real answer, I think, is the fact that if you had looked ten times before or a million times before for the same information, it would come back You're right at the top. But, uh, you leverage for all the number of users at Google or Live yeah. that are doing this. Try and think of something that hasn't been asked before and isn't stored in a cache somewhere. Yeah. In that space. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that's true. Yeah, obscure searches. Um, so I ran into an interesting company. So Paul Maritz leaves Microsoft, was it 10 years ago? Probably something like that. Circles around, does some stuff, and then he comes up with this company, Pi. And Pi is bought uh, in February or January by EMC, and they also had just bought Mosey. Mosey is a backup service. So somebody, some smart person at EMC saw the opportunity to get EMC into, com into consumer storage and to do it with a couple of acquisitions and then build on that. So I, I've been talking to those guys recently and they've really, and actually the one I talked to most is Charles Fitzgerald, a former colleague of yours, who was one of the most, I gotta tell you, Charles Fitzgerald was one of the most aggressive interviews of, of any reporter. You would go and interview this guy, you come out the other end, you feel like your clothing was in shreds. His disdain for the opposition and for the ignorance of the uh, reporter was deep, broad, uh, and abiding. I mean, he was just like, he was just so tough. So now he comes to me, he has a new, new company, you know, a new idea. And uh, he was very sweet to me. I was so, so, it was so nice to uh, have a guy actually treat me with a tiny bit of respect. So, uh, just because he wanted me to write a story about him. So, um, anyway, so they have... Their idea is to do the stuff I've been talking about in the cloud, at least part of it, at least the storage part of it. You know, storing all your stuff, linking it, looking at it, recognizing what, is, what it is, putting like things together, making it easier for you to find the things that you're going to be asking for more often, all, all that kind of stuff. And they get some AI technology in there to, to make it work. Um, so... Uh, the one thing that he told me, that was fascinating, I thought, but, and one thing he told me that really got me excited was, he said, 
we're leaving the era of device-centric computing and we're entering the era of personal-centric computing. Because of the cloud, you can use all those devices to come back to the center, and the center really is, it's all about you. So uh, I think that's a pretty good name for our era and uh, another, another reason to give me excitement. And I think, you know, and once again, these ideas that we had before keep coming back. And in this case, uh, the idea of intelligent agents is coming back. I don't know, I guess, uh, the Times, John Markoff of the Times, who's, I think, always or often at the front end of when, when it was time for a trend to come back, is, is there. He did a piece pointing out some of the stuff that was being done at uh, SRI International with DARPA. They have a, they have a deep program. And there are some little spin-offs that are, that are commercially oriented. So um, we're going to get to see some of that stuff. And one, one company that I've been aware of is a company called Reardon Commerce, who does stuff where they connect all of your travel and entertainment stuff so that if, you, if you, um, they discover that your plane is late, they will automatically tell the person that you're supposed to meet or something like that. So, or cancel your dinner reservations. So all those... There are these tremendously useful uh, services that are done in the background that don't that just take some kind of thinking through and are extremely helpful and avoid you know uh, mishaps. Um, now, I have a, I see this wonderful opportunity here in Portable Plus Cloud, but I also see danger because I am someone who's very nervous about any one company controlling too much of my life. Uh, and for that reason, I've always bought uh, and used software from a whole variety and hardware. I, always, I try to mix it up, you know. Uh, and so I'll have a browser, you know. I'll use Firefox. I'll use Outlook. I'll use, uh, so, so it's like I'm not, even though I recognize there would be some comfort in going in, you know, there would be some convenience in going 100% with one organization. But and, and at what point... When Google was coming up, I said, you know, this could be it, because they, they don't believe in evil, all that kind of stuff. They're, they're, they're against evil. And then I noticed that, geez, you know, they say that, but do I really trust them? And, uh, when they, and I guess when they started to build their own browser, I realized, oh, well, so they're going to have a client device, they're going to have Android, and they're going to have the cloud. They want to control the world, you know? And I guess they all have also said that they want to control the world of information, so I guess they shouldn't be so surprised. But anyway, so I look, I want to have most of these services provided by one organization. So there'll be a few little best-of-breed things around the edges, but most of it I want to come from, I want somebody to integrate it, I want someone to manage it, and I want somebody to manage it in such a way, I, 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 I I'll permit them to have a sticky feeling with me, so they can they can make me sticky, but I don't want them to lock me in. So, and I hope a lot of other consumers think about this. Get stuck, but you know, get sticky, but you know, but don't get locked in because I think it would be a um, it would be really a bad thing to to get for, for everybody to get locked in, and so that's why I'm for open standards, open interfaces. And a lot of uh, diversity. I think that's really healthy. So, same time I say that, I also say uh, Microsoft, which you know did some lock-in stuff in the past, and I you know I wrote about the antitrust case years ago, uh, won the undying enmity of some Microsoft people. But uh, I'm I've seen Microsoft behave in ways that are. I think are very impressive and very positive. And I would, I think Microsoft is in the best position to play this role of integrator. And uh, I'd be willing to trust Microsoft just as much as Google. <laughs> but it's all about behavior, you know. And so that's the, that's the thing I want to see. So um, mostly, I don't think negative thoughts about this. I think positive thoughts about the, the promise of the Portable Plus, the cloud. And, uh, you know, the fact that the designers and engineers don't have to pack so much anymore is a great relief to them. Uh, you know, I think there are going to be some new hardware technology advances that are going to be fantastic. Uh, Mary Lou Jepsen of the One Lap Per Child organization, formerly of Intel, uh, 
has done some wonderful stuff with displays. And one of the, one of the I love it when people, I'm, I'm not technical, so when technical people tell me mind-blowing things, I get so excited, I have no idea if it really is realistic or not. But she said, you know, think about the display as a big semiconductor. She said, one day, all of the circuitry will be in the display. And then think about touch. The interface becomes kind of almost, at some point, it's not even a metaphor anymore. It's physical uh, again. So that's, I mean, you guys may be wondering whether that makes any sense too, but, but it's not, doesn't it sound exciting For, from a journalist's point of view? It sound, I mean, maybe it still is a metaphor, but I think that's a really exciting concept that, that, we, that we'll have that kind of flexibility, that kind of ability to pack uh, so much capability into devices. So, um, anyway, so, the, so the, the quest to design the ultimate portable computer, ultimate mobile computer, is going on. It's accelerating. Um, you know, things happen so fast, and things can, can change so fast. Look at uh, Rim's Storm. Rim's Storm came out, some pretty good reviews, then David Pogue of the Times said, hey, this isn't working right for me. Within two weeks, they had a software update that fixed that thing. I mean, think about the kind, I mean, somebody else, it might have taken, in the old days, would it, would it have taken 18 months? I mean, uh, so the capability to improve things, to change things, to, to, to turn on a dime and really get things better is, is out there. Uh, you know, one of the things, when I started writing this book, I said, geez, I'm writing a book about something that has a history, and you, at some point you want to write the history, but then you don't want it to be out of date, like three months after it's published. So, you know, I wrote into the book some, some stuff that looked kind of for, further to the future so you don't feel like you're going to be out of date, but it's... Uh, um, I took that risk, and I think it, I think it'll work out. I mean, I think when I look back on it, I one of the th goals I had here was I knew that the people who had created this phenomenon, most of them are still alive. There were only a couple of people who were dead, and I was able to speak to everyone except Steve Jobs, and he wouldn't let me to speak to current Apple employees, but I spoke to lots of former Apple employees. So everybody else I wanted to speak to. Oh, the other person was John Doerr didn't speak to me because he knew I was going to ask him about pen computing, and I think he wants to forget about pen computing because he lost a lot of money in the uh, mid-90s over that. So there were just a couple of people. But it was, it was great to speak to these pioneers, uh, and I, I really appreciate historians now. I mean, my God, you talk to somebody who's been through something and is, you know, they were the person in the room. It's not just about, it's about memory. They can't really remember. When, some, when things happened to these people, these famous meetings, they were just living their lives. They weren't taking down notes, oh, this happened and then that happened. Things are a fog for them, even looking back a couple of months. So the, the closer you can get to the, to the time, to the person, I felt like, these people are incredible inventors and they need to be remembered. And they're memories, and I want to get them remembered as correctly as possible. So that was one of the, one of the goals there. Um, just a couple more comments. So there were, I think that, you know, uh, McGraw-Hill Books is a very, my publisher, very practical. So, and I think they're right about it. It's also a, the Business Week thing. You're, you're supposed to, give people lessons. And I, so the, the couple lessons that I would take away from this whole thing for inventors and innovators is, all right, so number one is, I mean, they're all pretty obvious, but the number one is just this, the, the idea of keeping reaching. I think some industries kind of get to these plateaus and they kind of get satisfied with things and they're making a bunch of money off it, but thank God the computer industry is dynamic enough that even the companies that have, in, that have a vested interest in milking a certain generation, sooner or later, they're getting on to the next one. So there, there, there is a, a momentum forward that is uh, that's magnificent. And I think that, you know, the startups keep it going. I mean, I, I think that we didn't have the, the startup culture and the VCs and the Valley and stuff like that. It probably, things could mature and kind of get, get a little turgid. So I think that's uh, number one. Be nimble. Apple started to, to <laughs> Apple took three years to develop its first portable computer. Uh, when it came out in 1989, it was obsolete. Uh, 
a month before the first Apple Portable came out, Compaq came out with the LTE, which was the first computer where you could do, it was a complete replacement for a desktop computer in terms of capability, power, all this kind of stuff. And it was about four pounds, whereas the Apple Portable was 13 pounds. So that was just a great example of, and I think that was the legacy of uh, Jobs. Jobs early on made the mistake of starting projects and, and wanting to perfect them and, and, and wanting them to be per perfect before they were released. And, and ultimately it led to a culture of um, products that came out too late. But I think now he's, uh, he's done a better job, obviously, of, of seeing all the pieces of technology and seeing when they can converge and, and being the one to converge. Obviously, iPod, plenty of MP3 players out there before that. He did the right combination of cloud and, and portable and device and, and, and UI that made it work. Um, and then the, the, that's the last lesson. It seems like so many of these lessons come back to Steve Jobs. But the last lesson is the importance of keeping it simple. I think in, the, in this industry we talk about that so much. We talk about it, we talk about it, talk about it, and then we don't do it. You know, I, I bought a, a digital tape recorder from... Sony about a year and a half ago that had a instruction book that was 175 pages, and I and I never could figure out how to do the the the, the four functions that I really needed. Yeah. So uh, we've seen in iPhone in some other devices things that have a a beauty. You want to hold it in your hand. I mean, I think you want to hold these things, these netbooks in your hand. You just there's something thrilling and wonderful about it, and to make them so simple that you never have to look at a single instruction, that it's always obvious. That's so hard for the engineer and the, and, the, and the user interface designer, but it's the thing that has to happen. So, you know, that's it. Simplicity. So. Thank you. Thanks. So we're going to have a Q&A period, and uh, I hope you'll ask some questions or make comments or whatever. Yes, sir. Stephen, uh, uh, from your perspective, do you think the uh, computing industry is evolving into like a, like a fashion business where every year there's, there's new fashions that come, come along and there's like a new hipset trend that people you know, pile onto and promptly abandon the following year? Is it kind of turning into this very uh, cyclical business where um, uh, things come and go very quickly? Uh, second question was, um, do you think that, uh, in fact, we are converging on a single device that is kind of the personal mobile device? Or, in fact, do you think that the Kindle and the Peak and all these other different uh, things actually herald the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the divergence of devices and the unique form factors that are very good at their narrow tasks. Yeah. So, um, so first question about fashion, second yeah. about yeah. do you see devices going like this or do you see them actually going yeah. like that? Well, about fashion. So clearly in the cell phone business, just basic cell phones, mainly in emerging nations, but also here, those are fashion, to, fashion items. And even in, even in emerging nations where people do not, do not have much money, kids are, I mean, in China, you know, in, in lower middle class Chinese families, stuff like that, kids are replacing their, their, their device every six months, you know. And uh, so I think that is a fashion industry, but that's uh, it's kind of like clothing, uh, and I think it's okay. I mean, it's wasteful of, of material and effort in some way. I mean, we have to think about sustainability on this, this planet. So I, I, I don't have a great feeling about it, but I don't, I don't feel like it's um, a terrible thing. You know, the other fashion thing is I've been... Uh, I'm, I, I like Web 2.0 in some ways. And I, I have a blog. I think it's very useful. I... Twitter, I wonder why. I wonder why people are my followers on Twitter. Uh, but I can't help but, and uh, there's this tremendous excitement about Facebook right now. Facebook, 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 the new platform, this kind of stuff. And I just feel like I've seen this before. And it's in some way, I mean, it's, it's an advance on some things, but in, in some ways it's like, you know, AOL, Yahoo, you know, I mean, they're, they're these things, that, they're these phenomena that capture people's attention for a short amount of time, and usually they lose, maybe because of te some kind of te technology uh, discontinuity, or maybe just because people get tired of things that they are familiar with, 
they kind of lose it. So I don't know whether, I mean, I think there's some, there, there's some kind of faddishness about some of the Web 2.0 stuff that I think is going to pass. I think some of the value that's been placed on some of these companies is way, way overblown. So I, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a, uh, a bubble burst there. Again, I have another bubble, kind of a mini bubble burst. Um, on devices, how many devices we have. So this is a big debate. And this is a beautiful thing. So people say, oh, I remember back in the early 90s, pager, then pager cell phone laptop, you know, and then we, I just want one thing, you know. And so it turns out, you know, th so th this kind of keeps exploding and then contracting and all this kind of stuff. And I think people thought, oh, I've got my BlackBerry, uh, you know, the, the BlackBerry smartphone. That's really all I need, except I, could, I don't even need to take my laptop on the trip with me. But then I think people find out that most trips they do need their laptop, you know. And then this, this netbook is another example. It's like, I see this, uh, I have, a, you know, this is, my, this is my personal consumer device. I have a desktop computer back at my home. This is the companion to my desktop. I'm real, there are a lot of things that just happen on the desktop. I don't, have to, I don't have to put all those applications and all that stuff and all that storage here. I can have, I can have 12 gigabytes of, of solid memory and, you know, and pay solid storage and pay $400. So I think that we're going to, this is one of the things that I think will discontinue. I think there'll be, and different people will find different combinations of things because not everybody's life is the same. Even a business person, a business traveler, they don't all have the same uh, things they need. So I think that that's going to be something that's still in flux for a long time. I don't see any end to that. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I was looking at the devices where you could actually get a smartphone, and maybe with a bit of a, you know, like a this kind of, devices, like those mid devices, and you could actually roll up a keyboard, it was a fabric, and you could put it out, and I said, gee, that seems like a great idea, and then I tried to type with it, and it really didn't work, and it hasn't taken off at all, as far as I can make out, but, but I think there'll be experiments like that, and some people who just want to be ultra light may find something like that that really works. Another idea was somebody showed me there was a device that you would set it down, and it would actually have a pro really project onto a little piece of fabric. Uh, and that was the screen, and you just roll that thing up, and it's like an awning. So there are all these crazy, wacky ideas. I think they're just great fun, and you know, you never know when when one will catch on. I mean, this, this form factor has been had five lives in the in the PC industry with different things. You know, the last time this form factor was a seventeen hundred dollar machine. This is a four hundred dollar machine. So suddenly, and and the kids, you know, and the use scenarios are different. So I think. You know, you, you'll have things that emerge as people change. You know? Any other questions or comments? Does, yes, sir. What are your thoughts on the privacy, especially in that context of uh, having things in the cloud and all of your information and LinkedIn? And My thought is that people want things for free, which suggests ad-supported services, yet the most valuable thing about you, other than a direct action to buy, is what you might buy next. And so if these operators of services in the cloud, if the main thing they have to sell to monetize their investment is information about you, then you ought to be very concerned about how much information you're giving away. So. I see that as a responsibility of the consumer to think about that. I, but I also think that the services ought to kind of lay it out, you know. And I think, I think most do. They say, we, is, is, do you agree, do you accept to have your, your information shared in this kind of aggregated form or something like that? But I'm sure there are many that don't. I mean, the big, you know, valuable companies do that because they, they have a reputation that could be hurt, but others probably don't do it. So... Are you wondering whether there should be like policy, government policy on this or something? I don't know what the solution is. I'm just, you know, thinking. So here's one example is, uh, I don't know how much of it's true that the pharmacies, that when people go and get the drugs, uh, that they actually sell that information to other companies, insurance companies, and things yeah. like that. So I don't know. 
Yeah, yeah, I don't know about that. I this is privacy hasn't been one of my issues that I've I don't have any special insights into it, I'm afraid. So, sir. My name's Bert. I was one of the lucky people that you called and I actually answered the phone and so Thank you, Bert. some of the um, some of the thoughts off my mind. When you were researching the book, I just I just wanted to say, I mean I I know, you know, these characters like John L and D yeah. and Jeff Hawkins and John Scully and your portrayal of these people I think is um, it's so honest and so clear that, that I, I think you know I think the book is fantastic. Oh. Okay. I want to I want to plant a seed though. I would I would love to see a similar approach taken to the development of the software. You know, ju just the, the world of software, especially as we're transitioning, you know, away from the pursuit of the perfect device yeah. and more to the pursuit of the perfect information architecture. I think a lot of people in the room yeah. would probably have some some good stories to tell you about that. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting. Software, I mean, pe in terms of writing a popular, something popular, um, it's much harder. Because you have to tell stories through metaphors, hardware, people can see it, feel it, they, they, uh, they've touched it, they've used it, they've had the experience, and sometimes they don't, the architecture, I mean, arch software architecture is something that is so abstract to people. Um, who did a good job with it? Uh, Scott Rosenberg wrote, what? Dreaming Code, which was about Mitch Kapoor and a pro an open source project about, uh, it was kind of, kind of like, ne still never finished. A and it was a, it was a good story because he was there in the room when they were having their arguments at the table and stuff like that. But he told the story through people and their relationships, and he would get in a little bit in the technology, but not, uh, not uh, too much. But I thought that was a really, if you haven't read that one, I think that's something that would really, you'd find very satisfying. Uh, but I'm, I, you know, one of the things that to me, that I feel, you know, I went to Carnegie Mellon University, but I have, I, I'm, not a te I'm not technical at all. I've never written a line of code. You know, I used a computer there once. It was a, it was a PDP-10, and I learned how to, I, I basically crashed a little moon vehicle on the moon about 20 times, and then gave up, you know. So that's my, so uh, ever since then, it's, I, get, I kind of get a sense of, under, of understanding things, but I, I really think you need, you know, and I think maybe John Markoff, may, I think he has more technical understanding. He's, he's a guy who could write a book like that, or, I don't know, there was another guy, uh, Pascal Zachary, remember him from uh, the Wall Street Journal in the 90s? He was a, a guy who could do that, but I think that is beyond I think I, I'm not the guy for that one. I'm just too hard. Too hard. But if you have any other book ideas that are, you know, <laughs> spin them by me. Though, like I was joking today, I, I'll just wrap up here, but joking, it's gallows humor. So my industry, and I define my industry as the, the part of journalism that tries to write really interesting, complex stories, is dying. And some people say, oh, well, write books. Well, what's happening to the book industry? It's like, you know, it's a double whammy. So if anybody, any of you have any career ideas for me, I appreciate them. <laughs> a book idea. Oh, good. Okay. Um, you looked at this in terms of industry visionaries that took something that didn't exist and was just beginning to exist and projected forward. Um, these were people that did not grow up. I think a book like the same order sequel that looked at generations, whatever we're calling them now, and see who has grown up with these. So my daughter, who was yeah. in the black yeah. Yeah. had a PDC but developer company, so I don't know what she was saying. Um, what her vision is, because she twitters and does all of these things, what her vision, so if you collected a similar group of this new generation and what their vision is and what they want in their device. Talk to the creators or the consumers? No, no, talk to, talk to. Yeah. Um, just <coughs> interview, not famous people that, that, yeah. that saw yeah. this at the beginning, but people who've grown up with this who are young and what they want, what they see, how they would envision computers. Is it something you wear? Is it something that yeah. does this? Is it one? Is it many? Is it social? Is it this? It's like and that would be a very interest, interesting and, and commercially lucrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the answers would be great. Give talks on that yeah. forever. The, uh, 
Don Tapscott, who's a kind of a consultant, author kind of guy, he wrote Growing Up Digital, and now he's written one called Grown Up Digital that just came out. And I haven't read it yet, but uh, it's got yeah, good reviews. And uh, I think it's, it goes into this. And he told me that he had got some, his hands on some research that showed that uh, depending on your kind of media experiences, your, as a child, your brain gets wired in different ways. It's, it's, it's essentially kind of hardwired in different ways. But what I think is the same approach that you took with this, you can make it international, you yeah. can make it global, uh, and then and you just interview these, these people. Yeah. Now you pick them, it's a different thing, but you, you interview them. Where is, where is it, where, what is your journey yeah. like? What's your yeah. perfect? Yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. Yes, sir. Right. Well, since you are a journalist and you know about the technology industry, maybe you got some ideas on, you know, what is the future of journalism and, you know, where am I going to get my news if the New York Times goes under? You know? Yeah, boy. If I knew the answer to that, the, the, the happy answer to that, the, the, the answer with a business model, mm -hmm. I'd be back at McGraw-Hill, uh, or I'd be starting it, actually. That's what I would do. I'd be an entrepreneur starting it. Very tricky, very hard. I mean, uh, you know, the web now is really a very good environment for short, kind of bursty news bits and attitude bits. Right? Yeah. Who, who really trusts the blogs? Well, some of, it's, some of it's, yeah, we shouldn't trust blogs. Uh, even blogs by, I mean, even my blog is less trustworthy than, than my news article, absolutely, because it's less deeply reported. Um, so yeah, those questions are big questions, and I, I worry about, I mean, the New York Times is uh, a bulwark of our society, and I worry what would happen to democracy if it was weakened significantly. Because most, so many of the metropolitan dailies are, are so weak that they cannot serve that function anymore. So it's, that's scary. I mean, I guess I'm a little bit hopeful in that, that, that someone will come up with a solution because, like, I didn't know what the solution for digital music was going to be until yeah. I saw that they re-released uh, Screaming for Vengeance full album on it was either Guitar Hero or Rock Band. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's the new mm -hmm. business model for music. Someone cracked the code, as it were, you know. It well, seems like it needs to be sort of like a rock band for journalism. Well, you hope that, that you hope that something can happen because people really do appreciate community. They care about each other. They want the truth. All these things are the things that promote good journalism. And some some smart person will come up with a successful business model. I'm sure. You know, I wish it were my boss. <laughs> I wish it would start there. That would be the experiment. You know, but I don't think we have it yet. Thank you, Steve. I'm going to leave time for people to have their books. Right. Okay. Yeah, I do. That's right. That's, that's great. Excellent.